Um, if you don't know me, I've been a farm consultant in Southland for, for nearly 15 years now, um, predominantly uh, sheep and beef work. And yeah, it's, I guess, um, a lot of what I do, uh, you'll sort of hear some about uh, either in your community or now and again, I get on the radio and have a bit of a chat. So um, yeah, quite a few of you I've met over time. I'm gonna flick onto the next slide. Um, so I guess, um, you know, a big part of what I'm doing at the moment is um, uh, talking to farmers about, um, you know, I guess what, what we do given the issues that, that we've faced. Um, I guess the, the first thing we need to do is just to highlight what the problem is. And uh, the, there's been two real critical factors that have caused issues this year. Um, one being it's been a really bad year to establish crops. Um, and a lot of farmers are reporting crops back by anywhere between 10 and 20%. Um, I have seen some crops that are 50% behind. And I have seen some crops that are better than average. So there's a lot of variability around there, but I think on average, we're looking at somewhere between 10 and 20% behind. And that seems reasonably widely accepted um, across the region. The other issue we've had is um, uh, a kill has obviously been affected. Um, we're quite behind on the kill. Um, yeah, the last time I updated my killing sheet analysis, um, we were just under 80%. Uh, and at that time of year would normally be at 92% of the kill. Um, so we've been sitting for a number of weeks about 12% behind. So rather than having sort of 6 or 7% of our lambs on hand, uh, we've got more like sort of around 20%. So, you know, that, that's causing a few issues for farmers um, because we've got increased feed demand. Yeah, so we're heading into the winter with um, yeah with more lambs on hand, and that's that's increased their demand, uh, and that's really chewing into our pastures. Um, we a lot of farms have seen frosts last week. Uh, it's quite warm at the moment, which is I think very welcome. But the frosts last week really uh, I think threw people a little bit, and yeah, started to sort of increase the sense of urgency of getting animals away. You wanna flip the next slide? Um, and the other thing we've seen is, is we're quite behind on our ewe kill. Um, so quite a few farms have still got ewes to be, to be sent to the works, um, cull ewes. Uh, some years I, I see clients kill about 20% of the ewes. Last year we got up to about 17%. Um, yeah, last time I updated the kill sheet, we were sitting at 14%. So, you know, I think we're probably you know, somewhere around, I don't know, about 6%, maybe 3 to 5%. Yeah, somewhere around there in terms of the, the number of views that we've still got to get rid of. So we've got extra animals on hand and, and it's creating a feed demand issue and our winter crops are, are behind. Um, next slide. So I guess that's, that's, running, that's causing quite a few issues around feed budgets. Um, most farmers are finding their feed budgets are stretched. Uh, yeah, a lot of the farms are sort of reporting that they're concerned or they're, they're, yeah, they're, they're not quite where they want to be. Um, we think uh, from, from the work we've done with clients that around 20% of farmers will face significant feed hardship. Uh, and that means that they've got some pretty significant feed issues to overcome. Um, there's probably a, a a good chunk of those 20% will find the solutions themselves without us sort of intervening or, or others having to help. Um, but yeah, we think that there's about 20% of farmers that are gonna face major, pretty major issues. Um, the, the, obviously the feed issues are wider than that, but we think it's sort of 20% are the ones that are really gonna face challenges. Um, and I guess, um, we keep hearing from farmers in that they're saying, um, I'll be okay if we have a good winter. Uh, and I, I often ask, you know, what happens if we don't have a good winter? Um, you know, two weeks of rain uh, really can change things. And yeah, I think if you're, if you're one of those people that are sort of relying on a good winter, uh, I think there's probably reasons to be a little bit proactive. Um, and the risk and the fears out there of what could of each weight, you know, if we don't have a good winter, um, in the event we don't have a good winter, um, yeah, I guess, you know, there's a risk of, of lighter use by the end of winter. 
um, early sit stocking onto grass. So quite a few farmers have told me how it looks like I'll be sit stocking about the 15th of August. Um, and the risk of a cold spell at lambing. And we know if we use a lighter and we are tighter for feed, then, then we do get increased lamb losses uh, in those conditions. So we're sort of set up for a reasonably high risk um, for a number of farmers uh, at lambing time. And so, so that's the risk that's presented at the moment. And it sort of comes down to us to think about what are the solutions? What can we do to mitigate those things? Um, you know, what are some of the, the tasks to do? And that's what I've been asked to, to raise. So I've come up with five tips that, that I um, have been using with other clients. So if you go into the next slide, please, Megan. So tip number one, um, there's a risk that some farmers will try and stre stretch their crops to last. So, you know, I have 60 days on my crops with my mixed day dues or whatever the strategy is, and there's a risk some farmers just try and stretch that. So one way to get around that is just to make sure that your crops are measured and that you allocate feed on the basis of the animal's needs. Um, that's, that's one way of sort of get a, getting away from that stretching the crop to, to um, yeah, make it work. And I've said by someone that you trust, and you know, there's some pretty questionable measures that, that have been um, performed and delivered in the industry over time. So find someone that you trust, that you know does a good job, and, and use that person. And there's plenty of te good technical reps that do good jobs out there, and, and a number of others. So just find someone you trust and, and get that done. Next slide, please. Um, and the next one is, um, uh, I guess, a question around what can we do to monitor the adverse effects. Um, you know, if we are pinched for feed and we do try and stretch that feed to last, um, what sort of monitoring strategies can we put in place? And one real simple thing we can do is just weighing a sample of, of each of your mobs regularly. Um, whether it's your mixed day dues and they often split into two tooths and maybe you've got some lights. Uh, and your hoggets as well. Um, you know, I think probably a, a monthly weighing interview interval was quite a good time to 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 do to weigh things. And the idea is really just to make sure that you're at least maintaining the animal's body weight, um, so that you're you're not underfeeding them. You're not trying to make that feed budget stretch and last. Um, and you really only need to weigh about fifty to eighty animals. You know, you don't need to do um, the whole mob or, or heaps. Um, you know, as long as you're getting a random um, subsample of those animals, uh, yeah, if you weigh 50 to 80. And, yeah, and that's just designed to try and stop us from just that slowly, daily, incremental underfeeding of animals. If we, if we monitor, it stops us from doing that. Um, and I guess that leads on to tip number three, um, which is some of the things we can do to sort of fix the feed budget if it's not going to work later on. Um, you know, if we do use all that crop and the crops are, are lighter and we do allocate it to what the needs of the animals are, um, and we get to August and we're, we're stretched for feed, what are the, some of the things we can do? Um, and the common ones that I'm seeing are gibberellic acid or progid, as it's widely known. Um, a lot of farmers are planning to use that this year. Um, I like to see it go on early August. Um, and the main reason is giving it a chance to have its effect. Uh, so giving it a, at least a month to, to do its thing. Um, nitrogen fertilizer is widely talked about. Uh, and in a good year, we can use it from mid-August onwards. Um, but keep in mind that your soil temperatures need to be somewhere around 6 to 7 degrees and rising. So keep an eye on those, those soil temperatures. But most of my clients are talking about using nitrogen in the springtime. Um, I, I think probably 80% of the, the feed budgets I've done are tight and farmers are looking at nitrogen in spring. Uh, and the one that's increasingly common is, is a conversation around sheep nuts uh, in the last 40 to, to 60 days to multiple bearing ewes, to your twins and triplets. Um, and most farms are sort of talking about um, pushing the feeding of those sheep nuts up to 300 grams a day. Um, there's there's a, a lot of farmers out there who haven't used sheep nuts. So I think, um, you know, if you haven't used them before and you want to use them, 
you know, take a bit of advice, um, talk to someone who has used them before, um, or get some advice on, on how to, to transition animals on. And a common question that's asked is, oh, is there going to be cheap nuts available? If everybody's wanting them, are there going to be enough? And my response to that is always just contract. If you're worried about it, contract your supply, uh, get it locked in. Um, just, yeah, we're better to sort of get these things locked in sooner and, and let the marketplace know that we want the stuff if we want it. Um, next slide, please, Megan. Um, and tip number four, um, I've sort of put down what I call the four key things uh, as an individual to ask yourself. Um, and the first one is A, it covers around 300 kilograms of dry matter per hectare lower than what they'd normally be. A, it crops back 10 to 20 percent. Do you still have a significant number of beef and lamb still on, uh, i.e. somewhere between 20 and 10 to 20 percent? And are you worrying? I think if you're doing those four things, it's not that painful to ask help to get a feed budget done. Uh, it really just helps you sleep at night and if, if nothing else. Um, but effectively, pretty much every feed budget I've done, we've put some really good strategies in place to overcome some of the feed hurdles out there. Um, and those, those solutions can be highly varied. Um, some farmers, it's, it's really simple stuff. Other farmers, it's really complex stuff. Um, so getting, getting a specialist in to do it uh, is is quite useful. There's a lot of people that have tra been trained um, through beef and lamb field days and, and the likes. Um, so you don't be sure to give it a crack yourself as well if you've been trained how to do it. Um, but yeah, I think this year is a really good year to do a feed budget, um, to write it down, and to make sure things the the, the dots join. I, I did a quick calculation and, and you know, if, if we do uh, increase our, our lamb losses over, over lambing, um, you know, the, the threat to, to the economic proportion of, of the business for my average client could be around $60,000. Um, you know, if, if we lose or increase our lamb mortality by 5%, that's a $60,000 uh, impact on our business. So, you know, the, there's... It's not that hard and it's not that expensive to do a feed budget. There's a good payoff on it. Um, and lastly, um, tip number five is really keep an eye out on each other. Um, you know, I, I, I've seen a lot of farmers talking through Zoom and we've been doing heaps of Zoom uh, meetings. I think it's really important to share stories about how you're set up and how you're dealing with the winter. Um, what is your pasture cover? How are your winter crops going? What are your animal weights like? What are you doing to mitigate things? Because what you'll do is you'll give other farmers, your neighbours and your community ideas on, on how they might do things as well. But you'll also give them tips that, you know, if you, if you are struggling, you'll give them an indication that you need a bit of help and somebody else can, can, can call you up and, and offer you some help. Um, if you're worried about someone, um, Often what I do is I'll, I'll ask a tricky question um, and, you know, and I'll sort of say to farmers, you know, I've struggled to feed my own animals. How are yours going? At? Are you worried about your animals? And, you know, if you get one of those responses where they sort of don't really engage you, if they look all around the room and, and don't really want to, to actually engage you on the issue, um, you know, visually, and, and you see one of those responses, um, Ask more and ask what you can do to help and yeah, and start thinking about how you can help that person in the community out better. Um, but yeah, I, I, I'll ask the odd tricky question and I'll ask a really pointed question. Um, you know, and, and don't beat around the bush, just, just, just ask a nice direct question and then read the person, see how they respond. Um, because ultimately, uh, a lot of these challenges are, are people problems. Um, I expect as the winter progresses, um, if we get a pretty average uh, winter, which is what we, we would expect, um, you know, we will start seeing some of these feed issues pop up and we, we will start seeing farmers getting under pressure and showing some signs of stress, greater signs of stress. And there's already a few signs out there already on, on seeing it in farmers. 
so that's my five tips. Um, yeah, hopefully there's some value in there for you. Um, I guess if, if you've got more specific questions, I'm, I'm here for those. Um, and there's very various other rural professionals that are, that are out there as well that can help. Um, so, yeah, if you've got more specific questions than what I've put up, then by all means give me a call. Um, you know, I'm, I'm only a phone call away and I'm pretty pretty receptive to, to all sorts of questions. So, Okay, I'll throw it back to you, Megan. Um, yeah, is there any questions from the floor? Are we allowed to take questions from the floor? Hi, sorry, I was trying to unmute myself. Um, so we've got one question. Um, will there be any carryover of, in, of nitrogen from an autumn application of 70 kg of urea? Um, I guess it would depend on the timing. Um, yeah, if you, if you put 70 kilos on and you've sort of done it in the last two or three weeks, I would expect some of that to be carried through. Um, and we will see, see a wee boost in the springtime. Um, they're not they're not real big boosts, but you will see things kick away a little bit better. Um, yeah, I, I guess that I always sort of have two feelings about that. Is um, you know, it also means we probably lose a reasonable amount of nitrogen during the winter, and there is an environmental consequence from it. Um, but yes, I think if you put nitrogen on the last couple of weeks, you will see a spring kick away from it. Cool. Um, we've got another one here too. Are there any good fee budgeting templates out there that we can access for free? Um, I wonder if Olivia wants to chip in there. Um, Olivia has been running, um, or Beef and Lamb have been running um, uh, feed budgeting workshops. Um, and yeah, they've got quite a good um, piece of software for that. Um, so Olivia, do you want to do you want to add to that? Uh, yeah, I can do. Um, so hi team. So yeah, at present, every farmer can access the feed budgeting assessment for free. It's simply by getting in touch with us and we virtually take you through the whole template. You get a, a copy of it at the other end. And it's sometimes just asking you some of those questions that you may not have thought of. I talked to a farmer um, the other day and he hadn't thought about some straw he had on farm. So it's just um, having a, a conversation with somebody totally outside of your system. And then we give you that as well. But if you need more support from there, at the present, there is also, you can go into an, if you want some, need further support, we actually take that and you can go on to somebody like Dean for free um, for another session uh, to be able to give you more support and a more in-depth assessment to being able to give you some strategies and also some ideas of where you could go from there. So if you want to know more, um, we will make sure we add it in the newsletter, uh, but get in touch with us directly and we can hook you up with that service. Cool, thanks Olivia. Um, there's another question here, Dean. Um, is spring nitrogen better with urea sustain or OMO phased end or spirit? Yeah, um, so I get the question a lot with clients and there's been a bit of a trend for using uh, nitrogen that's got sulfur in it. So MO, phased end, there's a number of different product names um, with different percentages of sulfur and nitrogen. Um, I do think sometimes those nitrogen sulfur products are overused. Um, I guess there's been a bit of a trend for using them more often, and you know I think sometimes they're they're over pushed or oversold in my opinion. Um, what I encourage you to do is think about the the winter that we've had. If it's been a really wet winter, um, then it's probably more likely that we'd get a sulfur response. Um, and the other thing I get clients to do is to retest a paddock, um, just one or two paddocks, often it's just one paddock, where we have a known sulfate level. Um, and and it's, just, it's just to decide whether that paddock has low sulfur in it um, as an indicator as to whether we would get a sulfur response. Um, so typically I'd, I'd ask a farmer to choose a paddock with normally a low sulfur level. Um, and you yeah, see whether it's sort of unusually low. But I'll, often I find when we do those tests that actually the sulfur levels are fine in spring, and so I end up often encouraging um, just, just the nitrogen product. 
Um, that's not always the case, but has been the case in the last couple of years. We've, we've had reasonably mild winters. Um, yeah. Uh, we had another one here, um, ProJib into June. Um, yeah, you will still get an effect from ProJib into June. Um, and so, yeah, I wouldn't be shy to use it at the moment. Um, it, it will still um, create uh, an extra, extra feed in front of you. I guess I'd be a wee bit reluctant if it wasn't being used sort of on the back of some nitrogen effect that you may have going on. Um, what ProJib does is it, is it just, it sort of creates, it brings your feed earlier. Um, and so it, you know, all you're doing is actually creating your feed earlier um, and you'll get a bit of a lag in pasture growth later. Um, but we know if we use it in conjunction with nitrogen, you actually get, you sort of overcome that lag that, that you get later on and you actually get more dry matter from it. So yeah, I'd probably, if it was me, and it depends on every situation, but I, I'd prefer to use it in August um, and in conjunction with a little bit of nitrogen um, just to make sure that we just, we're just just not bringing our feed sooner uh, and getting a big lag phase later on when we still need pasture growth. Uh, we'll have one last one. Um, when can we get an accurate reading from sulfuric levels prior to spring? Um, look, I'd, I'd be doing tests in August, no problem. So yeah, yeah absolutely do a soil test in August. Um, first of August onwards and you'll get a reasonable feel for whether you'll get a benefit from putting any sulfate sulfur products on. Um, 